So welcome to our first interview talk. So let's say this is a virtual round table. And in this edition, we are talking about the UAVs and what's inside these ingenious flying mega talents. And so it's all about drones and their um, fields of applications and their fields of areas of use. So um, between now and the interview hybrid event in September, we'll be keeping you up to date on this regular basis on the technologies and solutions of the GeoIT sector. And uh, today we will talk, as I just mentioned, about the UAV. So next month, I guess it's about BIM. And then in July, we talk about GNSS. And um, yeah, we'll see. We'll also send you the invitation soon. So um, a few words about myself. I'm Denise Wenzel. I'm Communication Manager at Hinze Expo and Conference. And uh, I work for Introduce since 2012. Um, there, the event was also held in Hanover, like uh, this year. And uh, you might also know me from Interview TV, our YouTube channel. So, everybody, please take your seat and fasten your seat belts because we're going to take this guys with Philip Amon and Kai Wackwitz and Dr. Rainer Keicher because we want to discuss um, the current legal and technical developments of the UAVs. And we will show you in this hour, the talk is about 50 minutes or one hour, um, uh, the applications, um, both in the research stage, but also um, applications which are already in use. And of course, about all the potentials in these flying mega talents. Um, and at this point, I would like to say thank you very much to my uh, Editor-in-Chief, Monika Rechheider, who uh, kindly helped me with all the questions and talked to all my guests um, before. So thank you very much, Monika, and also for joining us today. And of course, my colleague, uh, Juliane Jenke, who is also with us in this talk today. Uh, Juliane Jenke is also working in the uh, business development team for the Hinter Expo and Conference. And you also, of course, know her well, very well from the Interview events for Inter Area Solutions. So also, hi, Juliane, because you will take care of the chat. So if anybody has a question today, please uh, text in the chat or raise your hand um, and Juliane will take care of it. Thank you very much, Juliane. Hello. <laughs> Perfect. So um, I would say we would like to stay with the introduction of my guests. So um, to my right, I don't know where he is for you, is Philip Armon. Philip Armon is the manager of Unmanned Laser Scanning Business Division by Riegel Laser Management Systems. And he has been working for Riegel for over 10 years, initially entrusted with both terrestrial and mobile tasks. He has been responsible for the UAV-based product segment for several years. And he is the technical interface between sales and development. His topics are the platforms, sensor technologies, and their integrations. Hello, Philip Amon. Hello. Hi, where are you today? Where are you calling from? Uh, I'm actually in Austria, in our headquarters in Horn. Oh, perfect. And your background picture is awesome. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. So, and uh, next to Philip Amon is Dr. Rainer Keicher. He is currently working on the Diva Copter project. He studied agricultural sciences and earned his doctorate at the Justus Liebig University Institute for Agricultural Engineering in Gießen. So um, he has worked for the Institute of Technologies since 2006 and was appointed deputy director in 2013. His specialist and principal areas of work are steep slope mechanizations robotics, plant protection, equipment technology, and since 2016, spray drones. Hello and welcome, Dr. Rainer Keicher. Hello, thanks for introducing myself. Um, I just want to say the project we are talking about, or we are about to talk about, is Diva Copter, right? Yeah. Okay, and uh, this is the connection to drones. Um, oh, thanks again. Thank you very much. We start with that immediately, but we have a third guest today. 
It's Kai Wackwitz, and Kai is CEO and founder of uh, Drone Industry Insights, Germany, and is, it's a market research and consulting company for commercial drones. Kai has a degree in aeronautical engineering and um, more than 22 years of experience in manned and unmanned aviation. Long time, you look much younger, Kai. <laughs> and uh, from which he has developed in depth knowledge and extensive network. His expertise spread over numerous international consulting assignments, and he is globally recognized as an expert in commercial drone applications and all industrial sectors. And I know Kai as well from the Inter Air Solutions at Intergeo. Hello, Kai. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> so you're in Berlin, I guess, or? No, uh, calling from Hamburg. Um, Hamburg, ah, okay. I, I, today I choose an authentically looking bedroom as a background picture. Ah, okay, <laughs> yeah, as, as you just softened your background. <laughs> <laughs> So great, I see about 50 um, attendees are with us right now and everybody who joined us just right now, please uh, take uh, your chance to ask questions in the chat. Um, Juliane will take care of questions and also post these here to our experts. So we start with the first round and the first round is about um, the current uh, legal situation. And um, Kai, um, I just talked to you uh, right now. So let's have a look at the market potentials of uh, UAVs. And at the same time, the question of the legal basis for the use of drones. And um, well, I just uh, also know that uh, in Germany relies much um, on the EU as a regulatory body. And so when it comes to all the uh, legislations, um, I, I just you say it is lacking on all fronts. Um, can you explain this to us and what the current status of the situation is? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the the German regulatory framework is not particularly permissive, um, which which of course is a big problem for uh, an industry that has such great uh, and such a disruptive potential um, to do things completely differently, to do things much more efficiently to save money, to save lives, to increase quality. There's a lot of things uh, and a lot of um, good things that cannot be leveraged today because of these restrictions, right? Um, the EU framework is something, I think, very good. Uh, it takes a long time to build, um, which is a bit of a problem. EU is releasing uh, new amendments slice by slice. Um, it's taking a long time now. The whole thing got a lot more complex than originally anticipated. So we are waiting for... Uh, no, initially they started five years ago to uh, build this new framework and we are not at the end. So uh, in the meantime, Germany could have done things differently, uh, but Germany or the German uh, authorities are waiting um, very much on this EU framework. Um, and so they, yeah, so we waste a lot of valuable time, you know, to be uh, on the on the leading end of things to to leverage drone technology early in the process to have this first mover advantage like Norway or Switzerland has, and I think that's a great opportunity that that we miss out on. So um, don't get me wrong, there's a lot that can be done with drones today. Absolutely, um, the general regulatory climate, however, uh, makes it really hard for companies, especially in the service area. Um, to access this market and to to you know see the full potential uh, available today. Mm. And you also mentioned when you talked to our um, editor team before or to Monica, um, it's kind of a salami tactic, kind yeah. of that sausage tactic in the slice by slice. Yes, um, slice, so it's yeah. not like that. You get one big amendment from the EU saying, okay, from tomorrow you can do all that. It's always just a little slice and another slice and another slice. So um, yeah, it takes a long time. Yeah, it seems similar to the pandemic situation as we're actually all in. Um, it's also slice by slice and you wait a long time in the EU for vaccination and so on. There are masks or the situation. So um, let's have a look to Austria about the legal regulations and to Philip Amon. And uh, yeah, Philip, how far has Austria progressed with the implementation of EU drone regulations, uh, international law, or are you further along in Austria than in Germany, or does that have an impact of your flight, UAV flight operations as well? 
Well, um, <clears throat> definitely it has an impact. Um, so what we can, or what we currently see in the market, as you know, um, the new regulations are out since beginning of this year. There is now a transition zones where still old permissions are still valid and still in place, um, but now especially for ourselves as well in the next couple of months we have to apply also for a uh, yeah, specific group uh, or specific category uh, actually we did already so um, as we operate uavs um, less than 25 kilo even more than that um, we have to do yeah, quite a lot of paperwork to get them up uh, to get them flying um, operationally on a legal way uh, it's quite a lot of work if you have to do this from scratch um, actually, we already have done this work for um, our Recopter M, so the, the, the bigger brother um, of our uh, Recopter platform, which is actually, yeah, so we don't have to start at the very beginning, but it's a lot of paperwork. And even if, if you have to start with all this work as a commercial operator, it uh, costs you quite a lot of time and a lot of effort to put all this documentation together. So we are we're looking for for ourselves and also for our customers in the future, especially to get all these uh, standard scenarios um, for the specific uh, group more and more, so they can easily um, get an approval to easier get into the air. Because right now, uh, as soon as like all these um, yeah, legal aspects are in place, um, you have to fill quite for our Austrian legislation, quite a lot of paperwork, which of course um, you can fly with this approval, um, not only in Austria, you can fly uh, in, in the complete European Union, but uh, it's a lot of work, as I said. And we are also participating in a project um, called Air Labs, um, which is a group of um, companies, universities in Austria, um, try to get with the um, with the Austrian, uh, with the Austrian controls, with the Austrian regulator, um, more and deeper in contact to get this progress and this process done in a very easy way. But that's quite a lot of effort. Mm. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, Rainer Keicher, um, yeah, you just mentioned you are here for Diva Copter for your research project. And uh, so I guess you're also dependent on that uh, legal framework you have to work within. And um, how does you assess the situation and how much does this uncertainty of this unresolved legal issues affect your work? Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, let me say first, uh, it's uh, our second project. We started working with brain drones in 2016. And back then, uh, we did not have a problem with uh, air law, but uh, we were also affected by plant health law. Uh, maybe you know uh, there is the directive uh, 128 from 2009, known as SUD, the Sustainable Use Directive, in which it said, uh, frankly, aerial spraying is forbidden. So this was, until now, our biggest problem, and we uh, did a lot of work with other uh, work groups together, the JKI and so on, to legalize brain drones, at least in Seedful Vineyards. And I think we more or less rather uh, succeeded this year. So we were, uh, yeah, we hoped we could spray this year, but now uh, the air law. Uh, the 945 and the 947 are, um, yeah, <laughs> we have to uh, obey to them and uh, it's not that easy. Yeah? Of course, we have the easy access rules with 350 pages and we try to look where we are. And so we are on a way defining the, the concept of operations and the specific operation risk assessment and so on. and. Uh, but unfortunately, there is no standard scenario for our work to do, so we have to do it all from scratch, right? And until now, we didn't need a permission because we are authority ourselves, and we could until this year say, okay, we have a, uh, um, yeah, a SORA a risk assessment, and we know what we're doing, so we are allowed to fly. But now, 
well, uh, it looks like, yeah, until this year we we are allowed to fly, but we don't know if we are allowed to spray, and now it's vice versa. Yeah, we are allowed to spray, but now we don't are allowed to fly anymore. This is a little bit complicated. Okay, so um, from one problem into the another. So there are a lot of um, an uncertainty uncertainties at the moment. And um, uh, I would also like to ask the audience at this moment, we're about 60 people here right now. Um, what um, do you want to know about the legal regulations? What are your problems with? Um, maybe you're also from the US or somewhere from China watching us right now, joining us here and have uh, other um, things you'd like to tell us right now in this um, little round. So then please use the chat and um, yeah, the experts will also be here to um, talk about this and speak about their projects, their work, and uh, what they they uh, know about that. Um, okay. Juliane has no questions at all at the moment, but maybe herself, Juliane, you're also uh, <laughs> kind of the team of the UAV drone team at Intergeo. You know about that legal situations. We're discussing that in round tables since uh, let me check, 2016. Um, uh, yeah, what, what do you think about the situation? And um, yeah. <laughs> I'm a bit frustrated, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> no, I just want to hear some positive information. I mean, I think we have a lot of users here in the chat, and I would like to hear what can they do if we have um, participants who are interested in using drones or who are interested in order uh, drone services. What can you say to them? Is it safe to? Uh, to just use drone services. I'm sure it is, but when you look at the legal service, so I think we have to convince them that drones are great, um, um, yeah, a great technology to use, and we um, have to give them the information that it's still safe to to use the technology. That's what yeah. I would like to hear. <laughs> This is a really good keyword, so um, because it's the area of use and the applications um, who, who really um, deserve more credit than the reputation they have been given. So, um, Kai, um, in addition to the unresolved legal issues, um, UAV suffer from a negative image a bit, um, but do drones deserve more credit than this reputation they have been given too, too much? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know what you mean. So the um, uh, there are of course drones that you know are used in the military context, and um, of course they have not the best reputation. Um, on the other side, I think uh, a lot of people kind of got past this and understand drones as the flying robots that they are. Um, see the potential, see the um, the value add, and so I think. Um, I always use use drones like uh, an, an analogy, like uh, like a smartphone. You know, you have a you have the hardware and you have an operating system which basically controls the drone. But the whole difference that drones make is basically the app that they are used, you know, to run on. And um, yes, we know drones also from from a hobby perspective. But finding this app, you know, it make the makes the big decision. It makes a big difference between. Is it successful or is it not successful? And we see a lot of these things that are super successful. Um, as you know, in the in the intergeo or uh, inter aerial context, we talk a lot about drones in, in mapping and in surveying. Um, I mean, five years ago, we people were happy to strap a GoPro onto a drone and 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 create some aerial footage. And look where we are now. You know, we have fantastic cameras. Uh, we have laser scanners. We have the most advanced material flying over our heads, um, creating incredible footage, incredible, uh, incredibly accurate data sets. This is something that we we would be, we would have dreamed of uh, five years ago, and and now this is reality. So there is a lot more credit uh, that can be given to to drones than um, if you only look at the you know bad reputation they might have from from crisis areas or military conflicts. So drones. You know, in a remote sensing context, 
add tons of value. Uh, they save time, they save costs, they increase the result quality, they uh, increase worker safety. So there's a lot of value that they add, even though they might cost more uh, in the beginning. Um, the direct savings in you know making processes much shorter, uh, much more efficient, and also the indirect savings of maybe you know not shutting down an entire construction site to do all the surveillance work. Like these indirect savings are so huge that um, the price for drone technology is is in fact a little one to pay. Mm -hmm. Do you have any special examples where the, the use of drones was really an effort, maybe during the last year, during the pandemic or before, or any kind of techno technological resolution you had? Yes, absolutely. So um, we, we saw a few examples on how drones were being used directly in, in, in the uh, coronavirus uh, uh, context. So this could either be uh, use drones to fly patrols to check if all the um, you know, lockdown, uh, uh, for lockdown enforcement. Um, there has been uh, also, we talked about the spraying earlier, um, there's been drones that being, were used to disinfect certain areas, like very, very populated areas, uh, in, especially in hot regions. So uh, there were like those direct usage of drones. Um, and also, of course, one very important part is the, the delivery part in this aspect. So we saw a lot of uh, medical, urgent medical supplies that have been delivered by drone um, and corona tests and other things. And so it really started with this healthcare aspect and now is expanding more and more into pharmaceutical goods and continue from this more and more into the retail goods. So it really opened the door here. So, um, for example, we saw um, companies flying those, you know, vaccines and COVID tests flying around. Then uh, we saw in the US, there was a trial version from a wing Google company. Uh, and they made a one year trial. And um, the uh, demand was so high that they switched from a trial version completely into a standard operation. And now they've uh, partnered with CVS, which is a pharmacy uh, company in the US. And they fly uh, vaccines and, or pharmaceutical goods, not vaccines, sorry, pharmaceutical goods, uh, from the uh, pharmacy to people store step because you know elderly people that are not vaccinated yet are afraid to go in front of the door um, and now they have drones to deliver these uh, essential things and I think these are really good examples on how drones can directly and indirectly help um, not just to fight the pandemic but also you know really show their potential to do you know work for the people uh, which I hope is is a good sign um, that people might overcome um, this this uh, perception that drones are not only used in, in you know, uh, military context. Thank you very much, Kai. And uh, when we talk about areas of use, we also talk about the sensor technologies on UAVs. And right now, my question goes to Philip Amon and, of course, the Riegel, um, because sensor technology is constantly evolving. You also can see that at Intergeo each year. And uh, yeah, Regal is an international supplier of uh, the sensor technology, especially the laser scanners. And they, this is driving the developments forward. And so what is your company's position on the, the subject of UAV? What are your areas of use? Just take us with you, describe that any, any more, please. So first of all, I can fully agree to uh, Kai's comment. So all the uh, new sensors that uh, would like to get in the air. This would be a good connection point also to Riga. Um But let me give uh, you a brief history. Um, so we at Riga, we, we are a laser manufacturer, uh, actually. Uh, since a couple of years, it's actually now five years, we started with our, our own uh, turnkey solution, so with our, the picture you see behind me, the recopter. Uh, putting a laser scanner on a UAV. Um, we've at that time been the first company that had the platform, the, the sensor, as well as the software ready, um, providing a full turnkey solution to, to the end client. And uh, since the last couple of years, we have seen quite the demand and increase of inquiries, um, not only for laser, um, but also for the additional accessories. So all what you need about cameras. So um, we got requests about using uh, thermal cameras, hyperspectral cameras, uh, multispectral cameras. We, we delivered um, completely integrated systems on, on our platforms, but also on customer platforms. 
um, where we integrated uh, the laser scanner together with all these different kind of, of cameras together. Um, that, that all these time stamping and, and, and technical issues have been resolved. And uh, with regards to all the post processing, uh, so we can provide a full solution. And this was not uh, available a couple of years ago. Um, actually, what what we have seen right now is that they are. The sensors get smaller on the one side, so if you look for the thermal cameras, uh, um, even RGB sensors, it's quite limited with regards to industrial grade cameras, uh, because actually operating uh, sensors on a UAV, you do not actually need the, the full battery and, and, and the, the display. So we are um, looking for uh, new solutions in this direction. Um, but on the other side, um, We've seen quite an increase, of course, in the platforms as well. So it's not about um, multi-rotor systems or not only multi-rotor systems anymore. Um, we see quite a little shift in the direction of VTOL UAVs, um, especially by opening regulations, uh, hopefully sooner than later. Um, you would get the possibility to fly even for uh, longer ranges. And then, of course, flying um, a VTOL, you can start wherever you like. Uh, and it can go beyond the 500 one kilometer radius, uh, and you can capture much more uh, data, uh, especially if you're looking for applications like uh, power line survey, corridor mapping applications. So, um, and especially with regards to the UAV platforms, we could see an, um, a request in especially highly redundant systems. Because, uh, as Kai already mentioned, uh, you do not put only a GoPro uh, on the on the UVs anymore. Uh, the the sensors itself is like the the most important factor. The UAV uh, platform is uh, not, or we should not disregard it. But at least the sensors and the the end result, the deliverable counts for the end customer, and the platform is just like the, the second choice. So we have seen that quite a lot that customers are looking for highly redundant systems to uh, enable really more safety for these high, uh, yeah, quite costly sensors. And um, it doesn't matter which direction, if it goes in multi-rotor or VTOL, or helicopter, it should be um, more redundant with regards to flight controls, with regards to power supply, a backup power supply. Um, to really enable that the UAV platform is safely operating in the air and the sensors itself are, are safe as well. So the technology, um, your sensor technology is mainly used is um, the forestry, the traffic or monitor, monitoring of, um, of uh, power line routes or yeah, what's, what's the main area of um, the, the use of your applications? Um, you, you cannot only say it's one direction. Um, it's really depending a little bit on the sensors because we do have sensors that you can only operate off um, like 50, 80 or 100 meters um, above ground. We do have also sensors that can operate both. You can fly it on UAV as well as on manned platforms, depending, of course, on, on the project. Okay. If you have like a, a smaller project, which is just like a couple of hectares, a couple of hundred hectares, but um, there is a factor, and of course, this needs to be calculated by, by the customer itself, um, where um, it's not uh, cost efficient anymore to go for UAV, and then you would switch to the, the main uh, operational part. So you can take the same equipment, uh, you can put it on a manned aircraft, and you can make the same project uh, in, in less time. Of course, the, the operational cost itself will be higher at the very beginning, but on the on the long term, uh, you would get a much uh, better return. And then from the application point of view, just to, to complete this here, uh, as I mentioned, corridor mapping applications. Yes, this is one, I would say, main task, uh, power line mapping. Um, but for topographic, open pit mining, um, agriculture, archaeologic, uh, cultural heritage. So um, the applications are quite, um, quite a lot. Thank you very much, Philip, for taking us with you in the world of application of Riegelcopters. <laughs> um, Rainer Keicher, let's talk about Diva Copter. Um, what defined area um, is this application working? So what exactly is it doing? 
the diva copter. Well, okay, first I have to explain diva copter is an acronym for digitization in vineyards and agriculture utilizing copters. So it's not a copter itself, but it's uh, yeah, sort of a research project. And uh, well, in agriculture, we have uh, different tasks with multi coppers already more or less established. Uh, let's say uh, you are spreading parasitic wasps, not perhaps in, in corn, you know. This is a task uh, that's been done for many years, and uh, well, they are also struggling with the new air law. They don't know if they are allowed to continue or not. Um, we make uh, images with uh, several sensors. Uh, for uh, spot spraying, for instance, we make multispectral images uh, to detect water stress for irrigation control. Uh, well, we try to detect physiological anomalies, and a uh, very popular task as well is the row deer form detection. So we look for fawns in the meadow before we uh, move outside and mow, right? And uh, our special um, issue is viticulture, so um, we try, of course, to uh, look for the plant health and for water stress, and we do things like uh, yield prediction, and uh, we also have several problems. Um, for instance, the National Action Plan says we have to reduce um, the plant protection products risk about 30 percent until 2023 which is quite ambitious because it's almost 21 right and uh, the, the fertilization ordinance junior for autumn in germany says we have to uh, reduce the nitrogen fertilizer uh, especially in vineyards it's a problem also and so one task would be to increase the efficiency as well of the pesticides as the fertilizers and uh, yeah, in viticulture, we use uh, already fertilizer um, with nitrogen sensors, uh, meaning we, we try to apply demand oriented, less fertilizer and only where it's needed. And uh, ground protection products, we are working on uh, in a first step calculating the leaf wall volume and applying appropriate. That means if you have less leaves, perhaps uh, in a variety with, with a, a thinner leaf wall, you apply less um, plant protection products. And if you have more leaves, you apply more. The second step in our uh, research project is to try to detect uh, specific diseases. It's uh, down in Malu, uh, for instance, and uh, treat, yeah, also appropriate. Yeah? Where you have a disease, you spray, and where not, you don't. And uh, therefore, of course, we need a lot of sensors, and we also need artificial intelligence, because uh, it's, you, you can't say uh, a leaf looks like this, and this is healthy, and it looks like that, and then it's uh, not healthy or ill, because uh, you have, yeah, almost, uh, changing uh, stages of disease, light conditions, plant growth, etc. Everything is changing. So you have to um, use all the sensors that are available in the market. And of course, we were about to uh, buy a helicopter, but unfortunately, we couldn't afford it. So we have to look for our own solution. Well, and another task back to agriculture would be uh, perhaps um, spot spraying herbicides, right? Spot spraying mm -hmm. means you fly with a drone over your field and you look where you have some weeds, you need to spray and then you come with a drone and just flying to the single spots where the weeds are and spray there. And you don't have to um, yeah, drive with a big tractor over the whole field, you just can fly to these spots. That would mean a lot of saving time, diesel, and of course, herbicides as well. So there are several tasks we could uh, do with, with the drones in agriculture. Yeah, that's great, because um, these are, this is a really good example of um, how environmental protection 
really works well with the technology on the drones, the artificial intelligence you just mentioned, and uh, the sensor technology. But um, of course, it's also behind all that, it's also the drone technologies. You can detect uh, just um, the diseases you just mentioned. And uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a perfect example um, of the, the use of drones in the environmental protection. Um, are there any questions in the chat, Juliane? I just see a red bubble, but uh, actually I cannot open the chat. Do you have any questions to our experts about these um, applications of drones we just talked about? Um, yes, there is one question um, to Philip Amon um, because he uh, provided us with information for their solutions. And there is a question, can the laser scanner go through vegetation? vegetation different levels okay should i i will well, direct address it um yes yeah, so this is exactly <laughs> uh this is exactly where the laser scanner was built for if you would compare it um for example to um photogrammetry um so the laser scanner is the, the perfect tool um to go through the vegetation through the vegetation. Um, so what we actually are not able to scan through, of course, but the laser uh, shot itself, the emitted laser pulse, will partly touch the leaves, um, will give you a return signal, it will continue further, it will give you another return, it will continue further. So we're able to capture up to 15 targets um, per laser shot um, by using the, the sensors. And this is where you can you, you would get the, the top of the, the crown, like if you take now you're looking for forestry, but you also get um, um, points in between. You get it. Uh, I can talk about later about that, about the sensor itself, but by looking not nadir directly into the forest uh, and looking a little bit to the front and to the back or even to the side, you can even get the trunk of the tree, which is um, not possible by, um, by conventional airborne laser scanning. Um, and uh, you can get the ground and you have all possibilities by using this data, by filtering, by removing all the vegetation, which is above a certain level and uh, are just able to extract the um, yeah, your digital terrain model. I mean, that's fascinating. That's much more uh, compared to what we've talked about five years ago or so. So there you see the massive changes and uh, the massive developments in this field, right? It's, it's exactly what, what we have seen is the combination. So yeah. um, we, we do not disregard photogrammetry, not not at all. Um, so we, I, I would say 90% of our systems are always sold with a camera. So the camera has its advantage and the laser scanner has its advantage. And if you compare the laser scanner, the, the scanner is very good in the surface. Um, the camera is very good at some very narrow points when you're looking really for points and, and features in the point cloud. But if you have the possibility and uh, you have the right tool and the right platform to carry both, then uh, definitely make use of it to um, yeah, get not double the results, but you have all possibilities combining data for with LiDAR and photogrammetry. Mm, that's interesting. And then we have another question back to the first topic, to the legal framework. I mean, we've talked about the situation in Germany, we've talked about the situation in Austria, but here is a question in chat, um, and Kai answered it already, but I don't know if everybody is in the chat and can read it, therefore the question again, um, what are the positive experience in other countries can we learn from then, or um, what are your experiences there? What can you tell, tell us about that? Right. So, um, again, not everything is bad in Germany. Um, maybe I'm a bit too pessimistic when I, when I, we, we look at, at the global landscape and we see how other, com uh, how other countries just, just go full steam ahead. Um, while it feels a bit more like a standstill here, but it's, it's, it's not the full truth. So in a European, uh, comparison, I would say that France and, um, Poland are, are really having a decent framework, very progressive, really good. Um, other uh, other countries in in the European Union are rather similar to Germany, uh, maybe even less permissive. Um, when we look at uh, countries like Norway and and Switzerland, which are not part of the EU, but you know geographically yes, uh, then we see that they actually used um, 
their ability to make their own framework pretty early in the process and now are able to leverage this. So as an example, um, you see uh, uh, companies like Matternet flying in Switzerland uh, from one hospital to another, uh, back and forth, um, something that just simply cannot be done here in Germany. We tried it with the project Medifly here in Hamburg, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was really frustrating because you, uh, it, it was not possible to fly beyond visual line of sight above a city. Uh, we also here in Hamburg have a big control zone uh, in the city, so uh, you need to have permission from the from the authorities to to fly in a control zone. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of open ends and a lot of problems that we face here. Um, compared to other countries. So, and if you see it in, in Norway, um, Norway, uh, I think two or three years ago, they started a big program, um, uh, a two billion uh, euro program to uh, facilitate drone deliveries and drone technology in, in, in general. Uh, and now they want to start supplying their 400 drilling islands in front of the coast uh, with drone technology. And they made a few initial flights already um, and this is really looking, you know, super promising. So from, from that point, sometimes I'm a bit sad that we are lurking behind here in Germany when you look into, into the, the very close uh, European neighborhood. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, yeah, but I think the positive um, uh, view into the future is, is, I think that's essential So for the whole market. So um, it's good that you say it's not everything bad, but we have to be patient and we have to be strong and have to be um, see the positive effects of the, the technology. So here are some other questions. Does artificial intelligence support the work in the project DeepCopter? This is to you, Professor Kreisia. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot, but not Professor. Um, oh, I thought so. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, actually it does not yet, but it will. We are using hyperspectral uh, sensors for searching for these uh, uh, special bands in which you can see the physiological anomalies. And then uh, we're building a multispectral camera, 16 channels, to fly over the vineyard and detect these anomalies. And then we feed uh, a deep learning approach to uh, yeah, more or less see every uh, anomaly in every vineyard, in every uh, stage of uh, um, growth and so on. So uh, it will, in the end, mm -hmm. be used, but we're still working on it. It's not, all, uh, it's not used already. Okay. Deep learning is the first step into um, artificial intelligence. So you're first deep learning, machine learning, but then you go into direction. And then it's the next step to use artificial intelligence. So these are the yeah, <laughs> steps that you have to use. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Next question to Philip Amon. What's about vertical structures like walls and houses? Can you detect them, measure them, map them? Vertical structures. <laughs> Ah, uh, a good question. Um, actually, um, it, it was not as easy as in, or it's now easier uh, as in the past. Um, it's really depending a little bit on the sensor in use. So um, if we um, take a look on like the latest sensor we have on, on the UV market, it's quite, uh, I personally call it a game changer uh, on the market, um, the, the VOOX 120. Um, because it's uh, so lightweight that you can almost put it on any UAV with around two kilo. Um, but the, the passive tissue rate, and especially what this sensor makes quite unique, that you have also a, a forward and backward looking capability, um, as well as an ADR, of course. So you would have not three channels, uh, how you would might call it. It's like uh, that the mirror was adapted in a very special way that we can be able to look in three different directions. And this makes it quite suitable for, yes, houses or walls that you um, take a look on the vertical facades. Um, if you fly forward, take a look back and you uh, on forward. So you get the full 3D picture if you think about city modeling and, and these directions. But not only for, for houses and walls, it would be also for power lines if you compare it mm -hmm. to like traditional um, UAV sensors where you only have the nadir uh, look. 
Um, and now having the possibility to, to take a look 10 degrees forward as well as 10 degrees backward, um, you can get the front of the power, uh, power line pole um, as well as the back, um, as well as the points nadir in addition. And um, in, in all kind of applications, what I mentioned before, uh, forest mapping, we, we've been or we are participating in Austria in a couple of projects and with companies are looking for forest inventory and really looking for sensors uh, that are able to fly efficiently, uh, but you get as much as possible from the data point of view. So you get really the, the trunk of the tree, you're looking for details, and it's always a com um, a combination between flight altitude, the laser setting, the uh, point density you will get out at the end. And with the new VUX120 sensor, uh, I think we can yeah, cover all of this. And um, actually, we're starting to deliver the, the first ones uh, in, in, in this week or next week. So now it's getting rolled out on the market, and we'll see how, how this develops. Mm. Sounds great. <laughs> Thank you for your answer. Yeah, sounds great. And what is a, um, a, a, an important topic for the future, what we do with our work. So um, it's good to hear that we can use the technology for this one as well. So the next one is um, a question we raised already, um, but it's again, it's a, a long-term question. What is about the social acceptance of UAVs? Um, so, uh, will the social acceptance of UAVs increase if UAVs are used in the sense of susta sustainability, so the SDGs of the UN, as described by Rainer Teicher, or in local disaster situations like, um, e.g., like early detection of forest fires? So, is it the point why the acceptance will rise? Yeah, yes, um, maybe I can go ahead and, and, and answer this question. So. Yeah, short answer is absolutely yes. Um, the um, if you put yourself into the situation that you uh, I don't know live in a busy neighborhood and somebody will order a pizza via drone and you know is happy to receive that, but another hundred people will be you know exposed to the look and the sound of this platform and will be probably very annoyed by this. So um, that that as a contrast. If you take it the other way and you have a drone that is uh, zipping over your head and there are some blue flashing lights and you know that's a rescue drone uh, flying a blood donation from one hospital to another and probably right now saving a life, the public acceptance is completely different. Um, we see this in uh, Rwanda where the company called Zipline um, is now connecting every single hospital with uh, medical supplies. So Rwanda has, uh, I think, 12 and a half million uh, citizens. And now all of those citizens have access to urgent medication, to urgent blood donations, to other things that have a life-saving impact. And they do all that with only 16 drones. One sixth, that's nothing. Wow. And, mm. and that alone, I think, is, is you know, uh, proof enough that you can um, not just use drones to leapfrog the infrastructure like in Rwanda where you have no roads or maybe not, you know, roads that are not year-round accessible. But um, even, you know, in, in uh, Western Europe, I, I see massive potential going forward. There are tons of solutions that nobody knows about. There are firefighting drones. They can uh, fly up a, a water hose up to 30 meters and, and um, you know, distinguish a fire in a high-rise building where it takes forever for firefighters to get to. Um, there are millions of, um, you know, sustainable or, or you know, um, applications that have a direct positive impact on the people living there. And I think uh, it would be very great to have, um, you know, those cases promoted in a, in, a, in, a larger, in a larger way. Yeah. And I think, Philip, you just, we just spoke about the wood. I mean, this is, again, this is an SDG topic, so, right? <laughs> Philip, how do you see this? So yeah, can you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. So um, what, what Kai mentioned, I, I fully agree with that. I was not aware um, that it's already going that far, and it's um, yeah ruled out in the public anymore uh, already. So uh, definitely, yeah. With, with regards to forestry, of course, uh, as an example, now we 
we do have customers that really flying a lot. They're flying hundreds of hectares uh, per per day uh, by UAV. Um, of course, if you um, if you think about forestry, of course, this is um, not um, in the city center, I would say. Um, so the acceptance there, there, there is more or less no population uh, in this area. Um, you have small villages there, um, but as I mentioned, on the UAV side, we can fly on, on the maximum altitude already, which is legal to, to be operated on like the 120 meters. Uh, and you will not even, there are drones out uh, in the market where you, especially for the VTOL uh, and, and fixed wing uh, area, um, you do not hear them anymore. Um, so if you fly 120 meters uh, and you fly over the area and you fly quite fast, so with a multi rotor system, um, of course, um, yeah, six to 10 meters per second, but with these VTOLs, you fly really, really fast. and. Um, you do not hear them, and if you would see them, the UV is already gone. So um, this is, of course, um, yeah, it, it will change the market a bit, and we will see how this develops. All this is started, um, or is, is about to start. Yeah, great. Um, Juliane, maybe we continue with the last round, because we have about uh, uh, 10 more, 8 more minutes, and then we will close this first in a duo talk. Um, so, uh, yeah, gentlemen, <laughs> we all have gentlemen, and no ladies in this talk, but Juliane, Juliane, you're also an expert. I really see you have so many knowledge about drones. That's great. <laughs> okay, so we start with the potential um, of the of the drones. We'll finish this talk uh, because we said um, the drones are our ingenious flying mega talents. Uh, we heard a lot of examples. We heard about new technologies. Um, we heard about the areas of use, but also the problems of uh, the legal regulations in Europe or Germany. Um, so maybe we start um, with Dr. Kaiser. Um, what's the potential you see for Diva Copter concretely, or um, especially when do you think it will be in use? Well, okay, uh, this is um, yeah, a rather optimistic side of things, I would say. If you take a look at the ministry draw draft uh, that was rejected by a federal council two weeks ago, I'm afraid in Berlin uh, they don't see it so optimistic. And uh, yeah, we struggle with more or less uh, problems with uh, tourists in the region. Well, maybe because we're spraying plant protection products, I don't know. But uh, yeah, well, we'll see how it will develop. Of course, we have uh, um, yeah the potential to uh, do environmental protection. That means reduce the use of plant protection products and reduce the use of fertilizers. This is our goal in this project. And of course, we want to establish uh, drone technology in agriculture and in viticulture. And uh, well, not only uh, with our spraying drone, but also with our uh, drone control system, we are developing in cooperation with Deutsche Flugsicherung um, with the goal to connect to their uh, air traffic uh, control. And uh, of course, we also do uh, things to well, provide, um, yeah, um, the internet if you don't have. Uh, 5G, because we are in agricultural uh, fields and we don't have 5G, of course we don't, we even cannot uh, use our telephone on one or another um, place. So we are using satellite communication systems and that means we, um, we do something for uh, the communication outside in the agricultural fields, we do something for aviation security, we do something for environmental protection and I hope uh, this will have a positive effect on the discussion. We hope so too, because I guess there is a huge need for that. Um, thank you very much, Rainer Kaiser. Um, Philip Amon, um, so what potential do you currently see for these uh, flying mega talents? I mean, you already mentioned uh, so much potential for it, but uh, maybe perhaps also through no new technology developments from Regal. 
Um, yeah, I, I mentioned a few already. So the um, what I mentioned before, the, the new game challenge market, the uh, VOOX 120, I think this will be quite uh, in the spotlight in the next couple of months, um, especially um, as it's quite lightweight for, for the UV sensors. Um, doesn't matter which platform, but to be more uh, general, we as as really as really group, um, we will of course continue this development of uh, yeah new lightweight, highly efficient uh, laser sensors systems platform integrations and platforms. Um, we are looking forward for more VTOL operations. So uh, I see this person becoming uh, quite fast. Um, so you would not be. Um, yeah, you can cover small areas with one UAV as well as uh, corridor mapping projects with one UAV. So it would be multi-purpose use on the UAV side. On the sensor point of view, um, we're looking for what we have already and what will be, of course, um, in the next couple of months available as well, that there will be systems out that you can uh, use for UAV applications, as well as airborne applications, as well as even for mobile applications on the car, on the boat. So we try to provide solutions for, uh, of course, the end customer, but um, that he has not the, or he does not have to make the decision in which direction it goes. If it goes for manned operations, unmanned operations, or other uh, laser dedicated um, operation work. So in this case, um, we can provide sensors or sensor systems um, that enables you for all market segments or almost all market segments. Uh, and you can participate in tenders and projects and uh, yeah, deliver the end, the end results the customers um, would expect. Thank you very much, Philip. Kai, last question also to you. Um, yeah, we're talking about digitalization for years in Germany. Um, we had uh, so many expert rounds, roundtables, debates, and so on. But right now, with the coronavirus, um, the German economy is really going to take off with the digitalization. And so what seemed unthinkable before, the pandemic is suddenly commonplace, like digitalization in school and uh, yeah, all that. But what do you think needs to happen for the potential of drones to be leveraged mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, let, let's maybe start with what we are doing here right now. Uh, I mean, the Zoom calls and, and, and these kind of things were, you know, were pretty new a year uh, back. So, um, but people did not change or digitalize their processes because they wanted to. Uh, they did this because they had to. So the whole paradigm sh it changed in, in, you know, in which we do our work and so people had to change and i think that especially um you know one of those elements um of the new normal is what we call uh remotization uh this can of course be home office but that's just one aspect um it's more about you know decentralizing tasks where uh jobs where you use people in the field uh, are now maybe done by um by a drone, for example, acquiring the data, um, sending it back home to, to home office, <laughs> uh, not headquarter anymore, it's now home office. So, um, and, and I think that's a, that's a great analogy to the, the whole Teams and, and uh, a Zoom uh, thing that we have here. Uh, doing things on remote only helps the whole uh, drone ecosystem because uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic tool to do work on remote. Um, you get people out of harm's way. You can uh, you have drones that can fly, you know, huge distances and acquire data from far away uh, and send them back home. So I think that remotization is a is a really big thing. And um, we see currently the whole thing developing into two directions. So the one direction is that big companies that you know had drones on their agenda for a while. Um, as some sort of innovation project, completely stopped it and now focused only on their main business because it's a crisis situation. You have to, you know, get your get your hold your money together. On the other side, there are people that say this is now our chance to really move and to really make the next step and to to change our business model towards a more digital centric, you know, 
business model and and you know embrace drone technology and really go for it. Um, it really started with a software companies. So we we saw massive traction in in the software space where companies um, you know are evaluating data. Um, Philip, you already mentioned it. Like uh, you know you have vast amounts of data and you somehow need to make sense out of this um, and. You know, we, we saw a lot of those companies really leveraging um, this, and and um, we also saw other big companies that really made a big change by using by using drone technology in in the last year. So um, it's it's the same for drones for data acquisition, but the same also with the whole delivery thing that I that I just mentioned. Um, so if you um, yeah. If, if you look back five years, we, we had this, um, the EU, you know, five years EU policy making, there are still a lot of, you know, operational constraints, but leveraging drone technology is still hard. Um, if you, let me give you an analogy. Um, imagine uh, you have a washing machine, right? Which is, which is basically a very simple robot. Uh, a drone is maybe a bit more complex robot, but both are basically robots. You program them and they do something for you. So now you have a washing machine, but you can only run it at uh, 100 rotations per minute, uh, only at daytime, and only with a visual observer in front of it, uh, monitoring it constantly and always having one hand on the off switch. Um, and this basically, uh, or in, in parts, represents the world that we live in. So we really don't have trust in these robots to do their job on their own. Uh, they are totally capable of doing it, but you know, it's, air, uh, it's aviation, you have aeronautic laws, uh, you have to make sure that safety is always uh, paramount. So it's, um, you, you have still have those limitations and, and still people go for it and, and find ways to leverage it because you know, flying at daytime and flying within your visual line of sight still gives you a lot of potential. You can inspect wind turbines, bridges, you name it. There's tons of opportunity out there. So to leverage uh, drone tech, uh, you got to give them the ability to do what they can do best. Um, fly beyond visual line of sight, fly standard routes without constant human supervision, fly day, fly at night, uh, fly over people. Um, one way to do this is waiting for, you know, maybe another year for some new EASA amendments. Um, or my favorite would be like a nationwide blanket exceptions, uh, exemption for Sora evaluated standard missions. So if you have, uh, Sora is a um, special operation risk assessment. And if you follow this Sora process, you can fly complex missions. Um, now these complex missions, for example, in Germany, um, it's really hard to um, get approval for. So sometimes it's, uh, you know, it really depends on the person, you know, uh, working on your case, if, mm. if your case gets accepted or not. And that, of course, is, is uh, you know, really okay. slowing things down. So uh, let me wrap it up <laughs> real quick. Uh, my, yeah, my point is, because uh, the time, our time is ticking, Kai. <laughs> we are over an hour right now. <laughs> All right, sorry. No, my my uh, my bottom line is that um, let's uh, let's let's go with Juliana. Let's see the positive aspects of it. Um, of course, there's always more possible, um, but these things will come. Uh, maybe not tomorrow, but but soon. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to all my guests, to Kai Wackwitz, to Philipp Amon and Dr. Rainer Keicher. Um, this was very interesting. Thank you very much for taking us with you in these matters that we right now know much more about the situation. And thank you for talking about drones and uh, yeah, what talents these um, ingenious flying talents all have. So this was our first talk. Our next one will be in May, the 12th of May. It's then about uh, BIM and digital construction. And uh, yeah, this was Intergeo TV for the first Intergeo TV talk. If you liked it, call, uh, say it to your colleagues and uh, join us at the next time. Thank you very much and uh, stay healthy, stay safe and uh, bye bye for now. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye-bye.